I want to add my welcome to, to Tommy's and Dan's. Thank you all for coming. This is an important time for us, 10 years of CBMM. Important time to sort of celebrate what we've done, also think about where we're going. And I hope that's what you're going to experience over the next day and a half or so. Um, I am going to now tell you, uh, say, a bit about the future. But before I do that, I want to sort of motivate what, you know, why, why I'm even here standing before you. So with part of the CBMM history, we, you know, for, you know, and the NSF encouraged us to be thinking about this wisely so, is like, well, you know, you're, you're going to end in 10 years, as Phil said, and what, what, what's going next? So what's the future beyond this, this a center grant that's now at, at its end? How do we maintain those programs you heard about from, for example, from Andana, you just heard from Boris and Andre. How do we take that forward? How do we take the vision forward on the, on the research and to keep the DNA of that going in the future? And that's what we've been working on here. And I'm excited to share that I think we have a path forward. And that is really a credit to both the NSF and all of CBMM in, in making that happen. You, it has permanently changed MIT. If you don't feel that, I just want you to know that. It's obvious to those that have been around 10 years before and at 10 years now, permanently changed MIT. And you've heard about a little bit of this from Dan, and I'm going to highlight for you some of the things that I think maybe you do or do not know about. So we've, one of the critical things that's changed is we've hired a bunch of new faculty basically at this COG neuro uh, computer science interface, brains, minds, machine interface. These are some of their faces, just some of them. Um, and I don't want to toot my own horn too much, but I was department head for 10 years in BCS during this time. And it was a big part of what I saw of what an opportunity to, we could do and an opportunity that we needed to do. And so uh, many of these folks, I am proud to say that I had some of these minor role in helping to bring them here. And they have already helped transform from where we are to where we are now and to where we're going in the future. Um, we built up, as you heard of a number of people, a new intellectual community of faculty and students, both through the summer school, the research that's going on by the faculty that are here, and by these new faculty that we brought in. You heard about briefly from Dan, there's a, a new undergraduate 6-9 major. 6 is EECS at MIT, 9 is BCS at MIT, so so-called 6-9 undergraduate major. Um, I would say, you know, this is like, I, I toot my own horn, it's like, this is what I did as department head, except I'd be wrong in saying that all I did was I assigned Michael Fee, who might have been in the room here, who's now our current department head, could you help make this happen? And Michael went to work with our EECS colleagues to make, build up the curriculum, work with uh, CBMM faculty to design courses to, to be part of that curriculum. And as you can see, in terms of number of student interests, these are the course nine students, BCS students. Um, this, is, this, at least for some time, was one of the fastest growing majors at MIT and easily outstripping the number of students in course nine, reflecting the interest in this space. And to us, the excitement that we are training people that will be the future scientists in this area, the science of intelligence that we're trying to build. Um, We've built new training and outreach programs, and you heard about those just um, for the last 15 minutes or so from both Mandana and um, Boris and Andre. And I think one of the most important changes, at least organizationally at MIT, you've already heard about, is that MIT, in its wisdom, decided to launch a, a DLC called the MIT Quest for Intelligence. So this is, this is DLCs are essentially almost permanent structures at MIT, department lab and center, um, that is trying to carry forward and expand these efforts. Um, it's called the MIT Quest for Intelligence, and you've heard us talk about the quest. And it's now, it's essentially inherited the vision of CBMM. And um, that is the way we're carrying this forward, both on the research front and these program fronts. So I'm going to tell you a bit more about that going forward. Tommy uh, kind of said this. I'm going to show you graphically. We had, had an intelligence initiative funded by our then provost, Raphael Reif, that really got us started. Uh, Tommy and Josh, to their credit, were the ones who really got this going. Josh Tenenbaum, uh, around uh, 10 years ago, again, at the start of this center, this vision of we can bring these fields and integrate them around this vision of brains, minds, and machines. Uh, and as, as Phil said, very hard to get those grants. And they were successful in doing so. And that nucleated all this effort. Um, MIT launched the Quest for Intelligence around 2018. Um, and then soon after, as Dan mentioned, and Dan is now the dean of our College of Computing, um, the College of Computing uh, was announced, and the building is going up right next door. I'll show that in a minute. Um, and then soon after that, um, the Quest was able to focus its vision around uh, the intersection of brains, minds, and machines to essentially make that core of CBMM what the Quest is really all about. Um, and it also launched some missions that I'll tell you about that, are, that launched those missions and began to scale those missions about a year and a half ago. And, and so this is now where we are, where we have an, a, or a DLC called the Quest for Intelligence, Brains, Minds, and Machines, uh, as a research center 
within the uh, Schwarzman College of Computing. So that's sort of an organizational overflow of how it's overview of how it's changed MIT. Now, this has, has physical infrastructure associated with two here at, at MIT. We're all sitting in this building 46, top down view. Um, we're actually right about here. That houses most of the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences, a lot of the empirical sciences around neuroscience and cognitive science. Um, and uh, there's the College of Computing building, as I mentioned, coming up right here. Uh, it's, I think, no accident that it's right next to us. Um, and in fact, we are, whoa, uh, I'm sorry. We, um, I, and I, one of the other things I tried to do as department is like, we should have a bridge from this building to this building because it's going to be a really impactful thing. And um, uh, in their MIT's great wisdom, they decided that was a good idea. And we actually, the only building connected to the College of Computing, uh, we, we are, it's nice that we have EECS, computer science, robotics, and others right across the street. Um, here, um, but this we uh, uh, Quest will have space within this building, and um, this is sort of the the fu future physical home of, of of the Quest for Intelligence, brains, minds, and machines. And so it's not just a physical bridge and physical space, but I would say more importantly, an intellectual bridge between science and engineering of intelligence in the original vision of CVMM: brains, minds, and machines. This is how I think about that vision, sort of operationally, how things are actually unfolding in the research front. And I'm going to say a bit about this. And many of you have seen me say this slide, but I want to sort of say this is more than just these three things, but the way they interact together in a productive manner. So natural sciences, which are especially cognitive science and neuroscience, this is a big part of what this building is about and other parts of MIT are about, are gathering discoveries, data, measurements, findings about the brain and the mind. Um, those things inform. Uh, uh, ideas of how we should be thinking about intelligence, they have to be coupled with ideas like theories and principles of how intelligence might work, builds of computational systems that meant, mean to embody those ideas, and to bring these two things together into what I refer to as sort of integrated computational models of intelligence. And that's the sort of comparative, they build that, those ideas and then, and then compare them uh, with what we're seeing in the natural sciences. And you, you heard a bit of this in Tommy's slides. These things simultaneously do two things at once. They serve as new hypotheses about the mechanisms of human intelligence. Like all models or all understanding in human history, they're not, they're not ever going to be perfect on their first round, but they serve as hypotheses of what might be going on in various domains of intelligence. Those then drive new experiments to say, well, maybe these models aren't quite right here, here, or the other place. We can test that, and we can iterate that back in to further improve these models, essentially running the pure scientific loop here to understand this. These also, because these are formal models, they're not just vague ideas. They are built systems or formal models. They can be used in near term uh, to drive computing and engineering possibilities. And so keeping those grounded on the idea that these can, be, can, can drive technologies is an important part of this overall activity here and how these things inform each other, because those things can also then be analyzed, as Tommy pointed out, for deeper theoretical ideas, and we have formal models, that then can be, those ideas can then sharpen the builds that we do over here that then again inform, for instance, the hypotheses of how aspects of intelligence work. So I hope you can see this is, this is the, the virtual loop that we are excited to execute. In fact, we have been executing. And I want to say the goal is to build a science of intelligence by running this kind of process and do this in domains of intelligence that I'll tell you about in a minute. So when I sort of say, well, Jim, that's a nice picture. Why do you even believe that that could work? And the reason I believe it can work is because I've been part of seeing that work in an area that I know well. My lab works on visual processing in humans and non-human primates. And I can say for decades, we had a lot of measurements of what might be going on in certain areas of the brain, neurons measured across a bunch of visual areas, behavior that we can measure, a rich set of phenomena from the natural sciences. But we didn't quite have a formal understanding of what was actually going on. Um, what changed is that the parallel development of models, again, think about built systems that could serve as hypotheses for what might be going on, um, started to mature, in part informed by these ideas. Think of the original work of Hubel and Weasel and others that Tommy mentioned. Um, informs these model builds with more new engineering to optimize parts of those models that neuroscience couldn't quite measure, um, but led us to now this interplay between models that now serve as some of our leading hypotheses about at least ventral visual processing in primates. And these also served as some of the leading models of computer vision applications. And, and so this is a, a, an example of how these, forms, these fields interacted with each other. And this, I could say, has really transformed at least how we think about visual processing in non-human primates. And this is just one domain of intelligence. Now, that's an example of how it could work. This is now I'm mapping that up to show you for just this 
this one area that I, tend to, I, that I know well. But of course, our ambitions are far grander than just vision. And so that's where we're headed next. So this, I could just to map that for you, integrated computational models of fast sensory intelligence kind of came out of this, extended to other sensory domains like Josh McDermott's work in Audition. Um, this, these kind of deep architectures became, as I mentioned, some of the leading things in computer vision. And they were generalized with deep learning to apply to other types of data, then became deep learning in general, and became what we currently think of much of AI over the last decade or so. At least, I'm going to say, quote, AI. And they are, as I said, some of the leading hypotheses of at least the first 200 milliseconds of human visual intelligence. OK, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute. And this loop continues today and continues to drive this understanding forward. All right, but there's lessons here. This is an ongoing process, but there's some lessons that we take from this that we are trying to carry forward as we take, take this work forward. So what are they? So the first one is that if you can integrate efforts from the natural sciences and computing engineering, that that can yield payoffs back to both fields that I would argue that neither field could have achieved on its own. And so th that's bringing the fields together to the benefit of both. And we saw that in that example that I just showed you. And we think that will happen again in other examples. It is happening again in other parts, aspects of intelligence. The other thing is we can't just wait around to build bottom-up approaches from the measurements of the elements of the system that, and hope that they will self-assemble. What changed was being bold in building and testing integrated models that were meant to capture entire domains of intelligence, properly scaled. We didn't try to build a human and get it to stand up and walk, get it to do aspects of intelligence that were challenging but possibly doable. And that led to a better understanding of the integrated components and how they work together. Better understanding of the components themselves, studying it by that essentially top-down approach with guidance from what you're measuring in the system. Again, that vision is a great example of that, but that's happening in other parts of the field as well. Also, we didn't need, actually, it turned out, we didn't need a perfect understanding of every aspect of biology. We'll talk about this on our panel tomorrow and how, that's, how much that might evolve going forward. But even with approximate models of the neural elements, for example, we had some more meaningful understanding of aspects of, for instance, visual cognition. And again, we'll talk about this on a panel tomorrow and see how people feel about that lesson. And probably the most important lesson I would say here, and I've sort of already alluded to this, the first 200 milliseconds of visual processing is, of course, not all of intelligence. Right? All the models that I'm talking about here, they're powerful in explaining vision. And they're actually powerful in the AI space when generalized, as I said. But we still see they're, they're limited in lots of ways. And so trying to go beyond today's models that were motivated in that way to tomorrow's models, which will explain much richer sets of data and be much more powerful in the AI space, is what we're most excited about here. So that's a big lesson as well. OK, we say that this is motivating, I hope, to all of you and why we think about these things. But now, what are we actually going to do well, we have to try to take some of these lessons and then supercharge this to make, it, to make this real. Um, and so going forward, we've been, we need to enable teams of people to make these big integrated bets, to say, don't just wait and do the thing you usually do, but take bets on integrative, across fields, building systems that can try to cross, can kind of span entire domains of intelligence that individual groups and labs could not otherwise make. So we're trying to make integrative bets. And this requires organization around, we're doing that around something we call mission teams. It also requires significant engineering resources to try to enable and support that. For instance, to build platforms that allow us uh, to compare and contrast how current models relate to current data, something that Tommy also mentioned is an important forward going direction in both the behavioral levels and the neural measures. That's just one example of where we need, need to and are deploying engineering resources. And what we're trying to do is take the DNA that we started with together, all of us here at, at CBMM, into, and, and amplify it with these kind of approaches to reach this future of a science of intelligence. Now, we are not starting from zero. We've, uh, uh, we've had ideas of where we should start. And Tommy showed this slide here a, few, uh, a little while ago. These were the original thrusts of CBMM. They still stand, importantly, as the motivating thrusts of what we're doing. In fact, here is how we take these things and, and the work that's gone on in them, and you heard about all the research and the papers that have come out of that, and now trying to organize what we're learning here into mission areas. So these are thought out in the context of those different er thrusts that we started in CBMM. I'm going to list them for you. These are the core mission areas right now where we're trying to make integrative bets. One is the development of intelligence to reverse engineer the common sense core knowledge and its learning algorithms. Another is embodied intelligence to try to understand how physical agents can understand and interact with the world. Another is a language mission, we call it, understanding the relationship between human language and really human cognition. Um, that's a deep question in cognitive science, and current models are allowing us to now engage with that question. 
Collective intelligence, we often forget that our intelligence does not rise just from the individual, but for how we work together as groups. How do we uh, do that in ways that make us more powerful in, as a group than as individuals? And another mission area called scaling inference, which is developing platforms for building these kind of next generation models that we think are not only going to transform, possibly transform AI, but will transform how we think about how brain processing is working as well. And we believe, therefore, we'll do human scale inference. So, and these things are, I'm listing them as sort of as they're almost like separate things, but of course, that's just scoping things to make progress when we get started. We believe these things are set up to also interact with each other in a meaningful way going forward. Of course, we need theory to wrap all of this, and Tommy mentioned this as well. If we want a deep understanding of the principles of intelligence, that that will touch all of these different areas. So this is how we're going forward from where we've been. Um, and now, again, the goal is to try to take this um, from uh, where, where we are to where, to where we got need to go in the future. I should emphasize that every one of those missions involves multiple PIs um, from uh, multiple areas. It involves multiple CBMM PIs, and it's really driven off of multiple CBMM thrusts, as I mentioned, and now imbued with engineering resources as well to help support that, as I, as I also mentioned, as what we need to do. So again, this is our goal. This is how we're working forward and how we're organized. Today is not the day that I'm going to um, talk about all of the missions and what they're doing in detail. We will have events later that you get to hear about that. Um, to, today, I want to sort of also just remind us in the short time I have of why we're actually here. And this is really harking back to the original vision, and Tommy articulated this at the start, that natural intelligence and understanding its mechanisms, it's really one of the greatest questions of all time, the greatest scientific question. As my colleague Nancy Canwisher would say, and there she is in the audience, this is right up there with understanding our position, our role in the universe, understanding where the origin of life on Earth and the evolution of life on Earth. It's one of those great scientific questions. Um, but beyond being a great scientific question, it will change the world. As we get successes and victories along the way, those successes and victories are and will change the world. So the way to think about this I like this quote here, and I'll give it in a minute. Imagine a world where the mechanisms of human intelligence are truly understood. Try to imagine that world. Now, this is not my quote. This quote is actually from the late Patrick Winston, who was the director of the MIT AI lab for a number of years. And paraphrasing Patrick, uh, 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 to go a little bit further, he went beyond this. Imagine that world, as, as he would say, instead of useful but narrow systems such as chat GPT, imagine systems that are s as smart as we are that could change the world. That, uh, instead of knowing what works in K-12, researchers would know why it works, and that would allow them to, go, to do things even better. Systems that recognize culture, how culture influences thinking could help avoid social conflict. Again, think about that collective intelligence and how we can work collectively, and also how that can go awry, leading to, to social problems in, in our culture, and how we might detect and possibly avoid those. The one, one that's near and dear to my heart as an MD Mental health could be understood on a deeper level, and we might see new ways to intervene. We're already seeing the vision models showing us new ways to think about intervention that we wouldn't have never been able to think about without these models. And we think that will be impactful even more as we get these other aspects of cognition modeled at these more formal levels. Again, Patrick saw the future in his statements here, and I'm uh, just here as an ambassador to channel back those original vision. Now, these are, again, great ideas. This is very aspirational. But walking the walk is hard, right? Actually taking the steps toward that world where the mechanisms of human intelligence are understood in engine terms, that is hard. And, and, and what does it take? It takes a lot of things. Um, first of all, it takes supporters. The NSF, again, $50 million has been huge to make this happen. Um, that, and Phil, thank you for being here. Thank you for all your support and your colleagues. You brought us from where we started to where we are now. Um, other supporters in the room, Tommy's mentioned David Siegel and others, have supported us along the way. Um, it takes a, a community of supporters financially to get this done. Now, dollars is, is one thing, but what it also takes is people. This has also been mentioned, not just today's people, but future people. It takes a community of people that they want to walk the walk. I know many of you are in this room. This is why you're here. Um, we're trying to grow that community into more people that want to do this because this is not an individual lab project. This is a, essentially a human level project that we're trying to lead here. And I'd say, and these are at least two of the important things I take, and they, they've both been highlighted. But another thing that it takes is it takes people with vision and leadership 
to help us go this way. And here, I want to highlight my colleague and friend, Tommy Poggio, who's really the one who got this all started for us here with Brains, Minds, and Machines. And I thank you, Tommy, for everything you've done to bring us from A to B and point us toward the future. I would like to give Tommy a round of applause if it's not going to embarrass him. <laughs> so hopefully, I've whet your appetite of where we're thinking of headed. And the rest of this time, both today's panel and later, will be discussions about the ideas of where the field stands and where it might be going. Those will be fun discussions. So now that you're oriented about where things sit at MIT, um, we're going to have a break now. It's 4 o'clock for about 25 minutes. And I think we're back here for a panel at 4.30. So thank you all. See you at 4.30.